everyone, um, after this uh, splendid uh, beginning of the day, thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, we start uh, with our plenary panel. Um, each of our panel members is going to speak for 15 minutes, and uh, it will be very difficult for you not to ask questions directly after uh, the speaker has finished, but please could you uh, keep your questions until after the first 45 minutes uh, when we start the discussion for the remainder of the time left until lunch. And, uh, well, I'd like to introduce the three persons separately. We're going to speak, but first I'll introduce myself, so you will know me. Um, well, thank you for introducing me. My name is Margaret Sleeve Faulkner, uh, Professor of Social and Medical Anthropology at the University of Sussex, and I'm also head of the uh, Centre for Mind Networking. Um, the first speaker of today, well, all three speakers are going to comment on the main three themes of uh, today. So that's uh, inequalities, identities, and insecurity. Um, and uh, Helen is uh, going to start uh, today as the first speaker. Well, Helen has a very interesting uh, background. She's both a physician and a mathematician. Uh, for, um, she's also the director of um, Gene Watch UK, but she's had a, a very uh, interesting history of, uh, of various kinds of uh, work. One is um, as a participant of um, uh, Greenpeace UK. Um, I think she's been uh, working there for seven years, accumulating very much experience and uh, research. Um, during that, uh, well, after that, she joined Gene Watch and she became um, the director of Gene Watch a few years ago, I think. Um, she's been doing uh, a lot of research in various fields. She's been working as an environmental scientist and she's also specialised as a marine pollution uh, analyst, I believe, uh, particularly radioactivity. So uh, this is someone who is at home in very many fields. Um, Helen will be uh, speaking about genomics, realities and mirage, and she will be speaking for 15 minutes. Thank you. I'm going to focus on, uh, sorry, it's not working, okay. Um, I'm going to be focusing <coughs> on, uh, <coughs> focus on non-communicable diseases, but I think my talk is, is complementary to Andrew's in that it's describing the construction of an infrastructure around those diseases which is focused on prevention um, and which is driven to a large extent, I would argue, by commercial interests. And I'm going to introduce the topic first but then talk about the implications of the developing countries. So my focus really is on the theme of insecurity and uh, the the critique and the problems associated with this idea. Um, so the vision, uh, as articulated by Tony Blair, I've picked as my example, is of us all having our whole genome sequenced and this being used to predict uh, diseases, the big killer diseases like heart disease and cancer, and to treat us before we become ill. Uh, but there are questions then about what the biological limits are to these predictive tests and how useful they are to actually prevent diseases, whether this health strategy is a good investment, whether it will actually reduce the incidence of common diseases and how those decisions will be made. And I just remind you, I haven't put the figures here, but these non-communicable diseases that are thought of as Western big killer diseases that are getting investment are now even bigger killers in developing countries who are suffering the double burden of disease. Um, so first of all, genomic risk prediction, is this really reality? This is a very schematic diagram, uh, but you can see over to the left um, the idea in red that rare variants obviously have been discovered for many genetic disorders. Um, more than 4,000, I've forgotten the latest figure, but genetic disorders where genomics has really helped to identify some of those variants. Um, and there are rare familial forms of conditions like breast cancer, the famous uh, BRCA test that uh, Angelina Jolie had for those mutations. But I'm going to focus my talk way over to the right-hand side on the common diseases, the big killer diseases, 
and uh, the disputed role of genetic variants in those diseases. And you'll see in the middle there is mentioned missing heritability, which refers to the fact that most of the research that the research that's been done to date has not found the variance that was expected from twin studies in those conditions. Um, so there are conflicting scientific views. I've only got a few minutes, so I'm not going to go through it in great detail. Uh, but um, there are enthusiasts who believe that if we do a lot more research, we will find this missing her heritability and we will have useful, uh, essentially deterministic predictions um, of uh, who's at risk so that we can target preventative um, intervention in the way that Tony Blair said there in the vision at the start. There are many scientists, I would argue probably more scientists, who are now questioning this approach, uh, questioning whether the missing heritability exists, questioning whether genetic variants are really going to have that predictive value even if they are identified. And that leads us to two different views on the role of evidence where the enthusiasts are arguing for these very large biobanks, potentially including whole populations, to try and mine that data and predict risk. Whereas critics are arguing, well, we do need to use genomics. There are circumstances, as I said at the start, where it is very useful, um, but we need to focus that on the areas where we know there's a high uh, genetic component, for example, where uh, translating what works into health services is going to be potentially useful. And I'm on the critical side, I think it comes as no surprise, so I'm going to cite a few papers, uh, it's obviously not comprehensive, uh, where experts in the field are arguing that including these genetic variants at the many hundreds of multiple loci along the genome will be limited in predicting disease risk. So this is from uh, Miriam Cowrie's group in the US, uh, leaders in this field. Uh, a couple of other papers arguing that this is actually going to be too low to have any widespread medical or social application. And the second paper there from David Clayton, this would remain the case even if all the loci were ultimately discovered. So you can do the mathematics uh, making that argument. And there have also been papers, um, even uh, Eric Lander, famous for his role in the Human Genome Project, has, has pointed out there will be fundamental limits to predictability and more critical papers, including one of my own, showing that uh, gene, gene, and gene environment interactions, when you include these more complex effects, you're still going to have quite a limited value of your risk predictions. And this is uh, a slide about commercial interests, uh, a report referring to the crackdown in the states by the uh, FDA and uh, also by the Federal Trade Commission on the sale of genetic tests. So the biggest company is 23andMe, which is funded largely by Google, uh, which has been selling genetic tests online. And those have actually all been withdrawn uh, because they have not been able to provide evidence to the FDA that the claims about risk of cancer and other diseases are actually substantiated by the evidence. So there are two approaches there. There's a technology-led commercial approach which argues for sinking investments in sequencing large populations, allowing commercial partnerships to data mine it, feeding back risk, but limiting the regulation of those claims. And then there's a more medically led approach, uh, which is much more focused on what might be useful in healthcare and which does require regulation of claims and also uh, ethical standards on consent and privacy and so on. Uh, so what are the privacy issues? Well, DNA can be analysed to produce biometrics. So I would argue that the key issue is, is not the information content, although that's important. Uh, but it's the fact that it's a biological link to your body and your data. And that means that uh, it has the same use as it has to the police in terms of identifying your presence. Those of you with coffee cups lying around, your DNA could be taken off that coffee cup, sequenced, and then matched against a database to pull down other information about you. So when the police use it, it's simply to find your name and your location because you're a suspect for a crime. But for states and uh, governments, that's an immensely powerful technology uh, to identify not only you, but also your relatives and paternity and non-paternity. Now, I, I've argued that for common diseases, risk predictions are poor, but there is, of course, some critical information content around, uh, particularly around uh, genetic disorders and the risk of passing recessive disorders onto children, so I shouldn't forget that. 
Um, anonymization is essentially impossible, and there's no real dispute about this. Um, you can deduce identifiers by deduction, combination of information in other databases. So the, the idea is to link health data, social data, enormous amounts of data together with your genome, and knowing where you live and your age and other things about you can be used to deduce your identifier, even if the name's stripped off. But it could also be done the other way around, taking the DNA from the coffee cup, matching it against the database, and finding out personal information about you in that way. And there's new technology called rapid DNA, which is uh, prototypes are already being tested in the United States, which would allow that to actually happen on borders or on the street. Um, and people working in health services, or I've left the word NHS in there because I was focused on the UK, but any health service can also gain access anyway, or anyone that could infiltrate the database system um, could gain access, or access might be granted to companies like insurers. So the implication of building these vast databases and widespread data sharing uh, are that this data is going to be sold to private companies in the longer term privacy really can't any longer exist. Uh, there are concerns about stigma and discrimination, but the main commercial purpose is to use personalised risk assessments to market medication and other products, and there's a predicted massive expansion in the drug market, which is kind of parallels what was being discussed about vaccines, because prevention is going to bring a much bigger population into the market for taking drugs and other uh, medical products. And that also potentially undermines public health control. So the food industry, for example, is very interested in selling functional foods rather than removing sugar and salt and so on from its products. Uh, what are the implications for developing countries? Uh, very quickly. Um, firstly, you're talking about a plan that's shifting the focus of disease prevention uh, onto this kind of commercial model, medicalization model of selling products, um, rather than on factors such as tobacco use, unhealthy diets, pollution. So there's a very deliberate shift there onto what could be marketed, and that has uh, major implications for resources. Uh, the implications of privacy may be more serious. Uh, we work on an international project on police DNA databases where the uh, FBI and uh, life technologies have been lobbying for police DNA da databases to be set up in many countries. And the issues that people tell us about there, one big issue is in countries where sex outside marriage is illegal or um, you know, is, can even lead to honour killings and so on because you will identify non-paternity. Uh, there are issues about political dissidents being tracked, because you don't forget you can also identify family members. Uh, there are issues about sectarian violence, so a good example is Iraq, where the US collected DNA at checkpoints and used it to try and identify who planted IEDs. Uh, they've now got that database in the United States, and their rationale for that is actually a good rationale, because they said, well, sectarianism uh, can lead to targeting of people simply based on names. So we should remember that in Rwanda, the genocide was based on identity cards which identified people uh, according to their ethnicity. So I'm not arguing that the genetic content will be used for that, but it's simply the link to the name which can often identify whether an individual is some um, Shia, for example. Uh, so if you try to go through a checkpoint with more than one identity card to avoid being targeted for sectarian reasons and if your DNA was actually checked there um, that could uh, lead to major problems. It's too expensive at the moment but remember rapid DNA is coming and those kind of uh, concerns will be there in the future. There are a whole series of issues about safeguards which can be weaker or harder to enforce. Um, funding limitations in terms of actually implementing infrastructure, bribery, corruption, all these issues exist in the developed world very much of course, but in some cases you've got uh, less, you're going to have less civil society control, uh, depending very much on the country of course, and you have a major issue about costs because you're shifting resources into this particular preventative approach which can divert resources from other health priorities. So my conclusions are that the privacy concerns are primarily driven by the role of genomic data as a biometric, 
more so than the information content, and particularly the ability to identify relatives. The uh, that's not to say that the information content isn't sensitive, it can be very sensitive, but so is much of the proposed linked data, so it's the, the way the biometric can be used to access that data. And uh, the, the systems that are planned involving public-private partnerships could allow both commercial and state interests to track individuals and their relatives, the argument that the computer will know who you are, and these therefore pose, I would argue, unnecessary risks to privacy because the benefits of screening everyone are actually low. So there should be a much more focused approach based on implementing clinically useful tests rather than this blanket approach to expand the market as much as possible. Thank you very much. We're very forward for